All right, welcome everyone to the Magnet Seminars. Uh, these seminars um, is recorded. Uh, we recommend you to keep your microphone muted and turn off your camera if you don't want to see and hear. Uh, after uh, the talk that is about 20, 25 minutes, there is 10 to 15 minutes question and discussion. And at the end, there is a time to catch up. If you're interested, you can stay. Uh, next uh, seminar schedule, we have uh, 22nd of November and 29th of November, and all the previously available, all the previous seminars are available on the YouTube channel. Uh, for today's seminars, I'm really, really happy to have uh, Dennis Kent from Le Mans and in the US um, talking about the correlation using E23R and paleocycular variation in lavas of the Central Atlantic Magnetic Provinces. Uh, for train for constraining causes uh, of the end triastic extinction. Um, so thanks again, Dennis, for accepting the invitation. And now you are welcome to share your screen. We all set. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Anita and Greg, for inviting me to uh, give a talk. I appreciate the opportunity and. Uh, if I had uh, more time, I would have made the abstract shorter and, and hopefully the talk will be still fit in the time. So uh, I want to talk about uh, some sort of an ongoing project we've had for years looking at the uh, camp to Central Atlantic Matic, Matic province and what it might have to do with the uh, entriassic extinctions, the e uh, ETE. Uh, and there's a little reversed uh, interval that plays a uh, interesting role in in the uh, in trying to delineate this that uh, sort of will feature in this uh, in this presentation. So camp is about 10 million uh, square kilometers. It's uh, perhaps one of the well, largest continental uh, large igneous province we know, and it coincides uh, basically where the rifting of the continents occurred when Pangaea split but not, uh, not always. So for example, in the Northern part, there's rifting, but very little volcanism, but in the central part, there's, there's a lot of uh, camp, camp activity. So the, the, the interest is the, uh, one of the interests besides being a large feature is that it coincides with one of the, uh, the big, uh, they call big five, although it seems more like big three mass extinctions the Siberian, the end Permian, and the end Triassic, and of course the uh, the end Cretaceous. So, and the and so camp coincides with the uh, the end Triassic extinctions, which is uh, the interesting thing to try to explain. So let me go to uh, to the place where we really develop a good part of the story, and I'll quickly introduce some of the main characters I want to talk about. Um, here's Palisade Sill, a uh, kind of notable representative of camp. Uh, where I'm sitting right now is basically right there on top of the sill on camp. And the camp interval in the Ewerk Basin is um, consists of beside the sill, which is equivalent to the uh, to the flow, the Orange Mountain flow here at the bottom, of, toward the bottom of the section. Uh, is a feeder was a feeder for it. Uh, it has uh, three major flow units and interbedded sediments, and all these have now been dated in various ways in an interlocking way. So, uh, the dates shown uh, in the uh, in the column, like for example, Orange Mountain basalt to a one point five two. These are from Terry Black uh, paper with Terry Blackburn in the lead. Uranium lead, kind of. Uh, the, uh, the standard these days, and uh, the the cumulative uh, interval going from the lowest to the highest is roughly six hundred thousand years, according to uranium lead, and so that's used to validate the other way of uh, telling at least relative time is to do the cycle stratigraphy. Paul Olson's uh, uh, been doing this quite a while and doing it very well because here the interbedded sediments have an estimated uh, duration of something like 600,000 years, which very closely corresponds to the duration that is uh, delineated by the uh, uh, uranium dead by the, uh, uh, by the, uh, by the in this case, the basalts. The uh, cyclostratigraphy is uh, 
is uh, based on the depth ranks and other measures to look at variations in the sediment. They're continental, but they're for the most part are certainly the ones that give the cycle beautiful cycle pattern are mainly lacustrine. So it's a lake level. It's lakes go up, lakes go down. And that's picked up in the lithology. Notice the scale. These are all in, measured in hundreds and thousands of meters. So one of the other characters is that, uh, and I'll show this a little more detail, is that all the camp lavas, as far as we know, are of normal polarity, as you can see that here in the column with VGP latitude and the sample coverage whenever this uh, made this slide. And uh, except uh, the interesting one is the uh, this feature uh, just before the uh, lowest uh, basalt, the uh, so-called, we call it E23R, just the nomenclature. R is the key word, it's reversed. And it's a very at least thin unit and turns out to also be very short and serendipitously was discovered in uh, when we're doing coring and just doing routine sampling. So this becomes a key feature in trying to integrate or correlate over, over uh, global or certainly regional scales. The, the uh, the same package of lavas and interbedded sediment and similar is over in the Hartford Basin. And here again, um, beside the lavas that uh, Mike McWilliamson, for example, and Prevo have uh, studied the, uh, the polarities or the magnetization directions, in fact, these also extend much higher up the section from the uh, from the uh, highest basalt, the Hamdom, and another few thousand meters. And this has all been also, uh, the uh, durations have been estimated from cyclostratigraphy, astrochronology, and the overlying, the, well, the, uh, the, the uh, normal polarity, so-called E24N, or in the Hartford Basin, H24N is about one and a half million years long, and sampled with reasonable density. And I'll show sort of confirming data from from where you folks are, at least the hosts on the hosts are in Britain, that, that, that it is indeed uniformly of normal polarity. So this becomes important when hunting around uh, elsewhere, that the expectation is from this sampling is that the camp and the immediately overlying sediment, sediments about a million years worth anyway, are of normal polarity. And so looking now down going uh, down below the uh, the camp, um, the oh, this is sorry. I mentioned that uh, this is the normal polarity is very well known. We we sampled the uh, the uh, continental sediments with reasonable uh, that was done in outcrop with reasonable uh, density, but here in the uh, in Saint Audrey's Bay and the uh, related how do you pronounce that East Quantox Head section. Uh, very uh, with uh, beautiful sampling done by Hussein in a paper, and that is uh, essentially all normal polarity until uh, some reversed intervals show up, very similar to those we found in the Hartford Basin. And again, from the cyclostratigraphy developed independently in that basin, it's about a million a million years worth overlying the or total uh, overlying the basalts for a million and a half roughly. So a big, fairly decent size uh, duration, normal polarity. So what about uh, what about below the uh, below the basalts and um, and notice uh, notice by the way where the ETE is in all these. Uh, I'll get to that what the uh, what this uh, criteria are for identifying it, but they're again uh, thought to be below the. Uh, Below the Jurassic, actually, is why they're called in Triassic. And so below the uh, uh, below the uh, the basalt, the lowest most basalt in the Newark Basin is uh, this was uh, one of the cores in the Newark Basin coring project from many years ago, several decades ago. But it nicely illustrates E twenty three R where we first stumble upon it and have since delineated a little bit better. But there's about roughly a, a million year interval of normal polarity preceding it with, again, fairly decent sampling. And we know the age just by almost by inspection is these lithos, lithologic members are each uh, 400,000 years or so. So there's about two and a half uh, of these. 
But let me get to the more precise estimate, estimation, estimate, estimation of ages and the polarity sequence below. And that's uh, done with uh, uh, looking at the depth ranks and now various other measures that are sensitive to the uh, character of the sediment and uh, doing power spectral analysis. And here's, for example, looking at a nice interval where you have maximum uh, sort of typical of the best results, as we say in presentations, is the uh, yeah, maximum lake level. So the lakes go fill up, you have black shales, and then they're essentially lakes uh, evaporate. Uh, they Essentially, water goes away and you have uh, even dinosaur footprints. Uh, we, uh, so those are the power spectrum. The key, the key, uh, the key period is this uh, is the four hundred five thousand year uh, eccentricity modulation by the uh, Venus and Jupiter. So it's very stable, and this is the one that has the best possibility, good possibility, going back as a measure of relative time in the geologic record, such as here, we're, we're roughly two hundred million years ago. Um, the the uh, it doesn't take a great deal of imagination uh, to look at to understand what the, that the sediments are very cyclic. Here they are. This is a quarry. You can see the cars for scale. There's hundreds, and it just goes on for hundreds and actually thousands of meters. And the coring allowed us to quantify this. So to put. Uh, the kind of analysis, power spectrum, and other that uh, Paul Olson and his colleagues have uh, have done on that. So this is where this this kind of analysis extending over the entire scale that provides an age model for this basin and the adjoining Hartford Basin, based on basically mostly the data I sort of outlined. And uh, those uh, little squares are these four hundred five thousand year cycles uh, delineated in lithostratigraphy. And uh, you get this age versus depth, and this provides a mapping function to then develop a time scale. And this astrochronology is a floater. It, uh, um, it, it's repetitive, so we're not, you wouldn't be sure a priori where you are in time, except for it's pegged to the uranium-led geochronology right in camp. So this is the integration of camp and puts it camp into a broader context. So this is uh, then essentially this mapping. You have depth scales on the left. Those are the various cores uh, shown where we uh, they were correlated with them with the magnetic polarity uh, patterns and as well as the uh, lithologic members. These are all uh, the lithologic patterns well known uh, and mapped for many years. And then that mapping function with the astrochronology develop is used to develop the time scale shown on the right with instead of meters we now have millions of years pegged again to the, uh, in this case, just essentially uh, grounded to the nearest uh, tenth of a million years to the base of the uh, camp, at least as locally expressed in the Newark Basin. So that's the that's the time scale, and that's the context then for uh, starting to look at the end Triassic event, which is basically where 201.6 is on, on the slide. So this is the lead up to it. So we have the lead up, mapped here in uh, in various parameters uh, denoting time. And then we have the follow-up um, and in between is camp and the ETE. And it's the relationship between the two we wanna look at in a little bit more detail. But before we can do that, uh, there's also been suggestions from various quarters that there's a large a significant hiatus in the uh, in the uh, Newark record in particular, and uh, that would sort of call, throw a little monkey wrench in trying to tell time. Uh, the hiatus based on uh, some uh, characterization of uh, biota, pollen, spores, and stuff like that, and that they uh, don't know, don't appear here or don't appear in the correct sequence. And so up to a 33 million year hiatus has been suggested. This also the suggestion appears as an option in various time scale, um, like the uh, the Gradstein and others time scale. So this of course needs to be addressed because otherwise all that all the strata below the uh, 
below its uh, below camp and where ET is closely associated with would be essentially a floater. You don't know in detail what happened. So to address this was one of the main objectives, certainly that some of us had in, well, we need to test the continuity, again, the continuity of the APTS. The date is where the 201.6 is, and then anything below that, if there it is essentially dependent on continuity, and this is what we want to uh, be able to say something about how good it is. So the uh, the place that needed to go is someplace where you can date things. Again, sorry for flipping back, but below those question marks and below the 201.6, there are virtually no dates of any of any sort to uh, verify any portion of this in the Newark Basin. All the volcanics and intrusions are of the 201 flavor. But out, uh, out in the scenic west at the Petrified Forest National Park, for example, uh, there, <clears throat> there's again red beds, the favorite of uh, paleomagnetists such as myself. They tend to always work, retain a good record <clears throat> of the field history, but they also have ash layers here that um, have uh, zircons, the great friend of uh, dating these days. And it's, so it's this combination of getting uh, dated levels and developing magnetic stratigraphy and correlating it. Then we have a prediction from the time scale is to see how well that conforms. And this we published just a few years ago, uh, the polarity stratigraphy for a well core taken through, uh, through the Chin Li formation with its various uh, datable levels that is shown in that plot there on the right, and the uh, correlation, the magnetics to the uh, APTS with the prediction that is continuous, is essentially makes the prediction that the of the ages that the uranium lead closely conform to. So a uh, hiatus of anything of the sort of millions of years is kind of precluded by this particular experiment. And, and data. So we would uh, suggest that the time scale from the new work is, uh, is complete to a, actually quite a high degree. Again, then looking at the uh, character of the, of the cycle stratigraphy. So let's get to the, uh, let's get to the uh, end Triassic extinction. It's a, uh, it's a uh, sometimes called an event and Triassic extinction. And it is an event because you can see it in the rock record. It's not a, uh, here, it's that, it's that dark band uh, that you see here. There's a hammer there shown for scale, very discreet. Uh, something happened there. <clears throat> and this is uh, trying to understand what it was and what it is, uh, something that's been of, uh, of interest. So the, <clears throat> what, Here's the problem, and here's the interest, here's the observation, here's the problem, is that the, um, the uh, ETE, as you see there, going with the red line coursing across the diagram, is uh, delineated by changes in pollen spores and footprint taxa. Uh, that there's a, there's a noticeable change that's been remarked upon, and uh, a lot of a lot of things change in the terrestrial realm. Remember, this is all terrestrial, and we'll get very briefly to what I can say about the uh, the marine in uh, toward the end of the presentation. So this is terrestrial, and the polarity stratigraphies are shown here. So there's the uh, there's that Martinsville core that was taken in the central part of the basin, and then where the the, the photo I showed of the actual boundary is in. The, is in Pennsylvania, some the coal is an outcrop, Jackson Wall syncline. And these are lined up, uh, these can be lined up in kind of independently of the uh, of the uh, the uh, bias stratigraphy because of E23R. And again, is E23R, this reversed interval, as far as we know, from everywhere we've looked thus far, is um, say tens of thousands of years. How do we know tens of thousands? This is based on the cycle stratigraphy in a polarity is subdivised a long normal about two and a half million years. So this is the only reversed interval in that in that in that in that neighborhood. So this is the basis for correlating on on that. It's uh, it's fairly unique in that in that general time frame. So the and so what we have is kind of a sandwich. We have E23R and going up we have the ETE 
and then comes the lowest uh, camp basalt. So trying to make an inference that the ETE was caused by the, uh, had some, there's some causal relationship with the camp is uh, things don't, uh, things don't look uh, like they uh, would, uh, don't look like they would work out. But this is, uh, so this is, this is the, uh, so this is an interesting problem of causality. This is back, uh, this was a paper in, back in 20, 20 years ago that they were even suggested that there may have been an impact because there was some traces of iridium, just looking at something that was decoupled from, uh, decoupled from camp. Uh, we don't think that anymore. Um, so what, what sort of broadened it out a little bit, and this is all we, this is, uh, this is sort of a, trying to explain why what we what we're up to today we sort of abandoned a lot of this because uh uh in a in a in the uh Torsdal section in the high atlas of morocco a uh, the uh, the berkeley group found a uh, a uh, a reverse polarity limestone and uh in in within the in so-called intermediate basalts identified characterized a, by their chemistry, like for example, the uh, TiO2 figure on the right. And uh, so then in other words, the, the, the E243R that we saw below the basalts in the Newark Basin in the Eastern North America camp was actually may have occurred within the basalts in Morocco. And so there's a causality essentially is uh, is re uh, at least allowable to have the camp, some part of the camp cause some parts, uh, cause the ETE. So it was on this basis that we uh, wanted to find some other indication of, of ETE, of the, uh, sorry, of the E23R in one of the lavas in Eastern North America. And the place that hadn't been studied for a while is the Fundy Basin of Nova Scotia, at least the, uh, the basalts haven't been studied. We hardly, and uh, the basalts. Uh, it's a it's a nice place to visit. It has uh, it in in uh, in nice outcrop. We have tri Triassic sediments of the Blomidon formation, which we looked at in a core hole, had done in a, in a repository there, and the basalt is overlying it. And uh, so it was the basalt that we then focused on in the in the hope of finding E twenty three R. And uh, just uh, just a crude uh, map of the uh, of the uh, of the Orange Mountain. I'm sorry, the um, North Mountain basalt extends for several hundred kilometers, so a lot of opportunity to sample. We focused on something called MM. It's the Margaretsville member, volcanologically delineated. That has is a lot of thin flows, and compared to like the on the East Ferry member below, which is basically one massive couple hundred meter uh, thick flow or the uh, Briar Island member also thicker. The I, we uh, Something has been known about the upper and lower members is the Margaretsville that we thought has the best chance because it wasn't uh, sampled very well for finding E23R. Um, the stuff is a basalt, it behaves pretty well. And here actually you see the main conclusion from this is that the lower member has declinations, the black symbols to the east of north and the briar island, the upper member had west of north. And so this, this whole unit after sampling all this basically had these two, these two populations of, uh, of directions uh, and lower and upper representing the lower and upper uh, part of the North Mountain basalt and all the Margaretsville members shown in the center diagram essentially fell either one. So they were small flows, either the waning stages of one direction, one emplacement or the uh, spin up of, of the next one. So these refer to as directional groups, because they cluster and they, they actually compare quite well to what Carmichael and Palmer did in late 60s. And uh, the major difference is there's a little bit drawn closer to the prisoner's field because they use a lower demagnization level, only about 20 millitesla's. We typically went to 80, and that's how we removed more of them. But basically, no big surprise here, but no E23R. So uh, what, what's the Sorry, story? Then it's another few minutes. Perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, we'll go faster. 
Uh, so, yeah, so the idea was that E23R is probably remagnetized, the, what was called it in the, in the Morocco sections. And uh, so there was no, uh, if you discount that, then everything fits, especially when uh, Mark Dineen and his group in Utrecht found E23R below the basalt. So this is exactly what's found in the East Coast basins. And so the uh, trying to correlate then what we found, this is now a resurrection of uh, those data and the uh, Fundy Basin and to the uh, to the uh, Morocco sections that the that uh, Knight and others uh, delineated. Then this is a tentative correlation and looking at them as uh, VGPs, um, it looked like that may be part of the same pa a similar pattern, more or less as we see in the modern observatory records of Paris and uh, and London. And so this is uh, basically just one more slide, just about done. So this is the basic picture that we uh, that we get, and is that the in the Argana Basin, the uh, the uh, there's almost there's virtually no ETE. It's right up against the lowest uh, lowest basalt compared to maybe ten thousand years before the basalt that I described in the Newark Basin. And the Fundy Basin is somewhere in between. It's just you know a few tens of centimeters below the basalt. So it looks like if there's a smoking gun for the ETE as if having something to do with the camp, it would be the uh, the lowest lowest most directional group in Argana. And uh, the in terms of uh, causal mechanisms, it kind of two ways general ways people have thought about this. One was CO2, that's the general one that's talked about a lot. We don't think that this is likely because we do have, it's one of the only large igneous provinces, we have more or less direct estimates of CO2 based on a thermometer, uh, thermometer, barometer, pedogenic uh, carbonate barometer in the in the sediment. So if you look at the Diagnosis uh, Morgan Shallow's uh, thesis work, I uh, noticed that the there's a large increase in PCO2 estimated across the lower uh, lower basalt unit. And uh, that's kind of uh, hard to do with the estimating with the volume of basalt that's, uh, that's shown there. So the other way of doing it is that's is the, uh, let me go back just quickly, is the, um, with the with the lava coincident, what appears to be stratigraphically coincident with the ETE is through a volcanic winter mechanism, aerosols that are injected very quickly. And so the, just the last slide is uh, trying to then say, well, what about the marine realm? Well, the marine realm, the only places that we're familiar with that have a polarity stratigraphy to try to uh, relate these uh, events in the continents and the and the uh, and land and sea, uh, not too many ammonites have floated up on land, and uh, there may be some pollen and dinoflagellate. They get to the marine realm, but this is a this is a bit of a puzzle, and this is uh, this is one effort going going back a ways, and actually, uh, not sure if we have information that uh, that radically uh, improves it, other than that question mark I have for the. Uh, the uh, reversed up in the um, in the in the uh, continental uh, section is the one from uh, is one from Morocco you know, that's been uh, kind of relegated to remagnetization. So the the problem is that the uh, number of polarity intervals in the uh, the best section is the Saint Audrey's Bay that Mark Hounslow and his colleagues have delineated the magnetics and. In that section has three three polarity intervals, whereas, as far as we know, it's based on basically information I showed early in the presentation, there is only one. So something is missing, or something is added on in one or the other that remains to be resolved. So this is my last slide, and I can uh, type take. Uh, I can end it right there. So the, again, the idea is that the um, the uh, we, we making estimates of the PCO2 entries from the from the so-called HTQ volcanics, the high titanium quartz volcanics, the lowest one, 
is uh, is kind of large to get because we're starting out at one or two thousand ppm in the atmosphere. So you need an enormous amount to double it. And that's kind of hard to do. And it looks basically kind of late for the most part. So that's why we are sort of enamored with the uh, intense volcanic winter scenario to knock out the to knock out the uh, uninsulated dinosaurs and uh, or uh, uh, reptiles and others to cause that extinction. So thanks. Thank you very much, Dennis. Big, big round of applause. Um, thank you very much. Um, there is time for question. If uh, somebody wants to ask them, you can type it in the chat and I can read it or you can unmute yourself, raise your hand. Hi, Dennis. It's uh, Phil McCausland here. I have a, a question perhaps you must have dealt with over the years. Uh, especially now you brought up at the end of your talk. Uh, thanks for the talk, by the way. That was really nicely illustrated. <laughs> There's a lot to learn here. Um, one, um, is it right towards the end of your talk, you were making a comparison with a sedimentary section where the recording mechanism that we have is different for magnetostratigraphy. So I was wondering if you could comment a bit about that, about the stochastic nature of, of volcanic flow sections and what do we actually get when we're trying to look for reverse polarity in there? You know, how how what was the rate of eruption in a sense of flow by flow by flow for camp generally? Is this known? Uh, well, I think the, uh, let's see. Uh, one second. I think uh, I think the group in Paris said this very well. I have a quote there from Chenet and others. This is work on the Deccan. And it's an interesting view that these directional groups, that they have, it's a snapshot of the field, or, so, or but uh, a, a limited time of the field, because the directions from successive flows, I say, those are the snapshot recordings. And then if you have a succession of them, like, uh, let's say, for example, DG2, there's, in the uh, in the case of the Morocco sections, there's hardly any difference for a dozen flows or so. So the if those all formed within a, a fairly short time to capture hardly any secular variation, then most of the, then they're very short in time for them to that as a as a as a cooling, let's say, and then record the field. And so they may only represent so all these. Uh, single eruptive events may represent a minuscule amount of time. It's kind of a, a uh, even though the, uh, it's kind of an interesting view. So even though the, let's say the uranium lead dates to the degree to which they can resolve, you know, this, oops, yeah, I mean, looking, uh, look, uh, I put a, just a, uh, to illustrate a, um, like a, a Gaussian, what the resolution is for 30,000 years. And that's, thought to be pretty good and that doesn't resolve many of the many of these issues and so going to these uh trying to infer something from the um directional groups and how they you can go you can like well even here in the in the uh in the argana or the uh tours or the high atlas section dozen flows have hardly a difference in direction. That sort of suggests that there's secular variation going on, which we have no reason to believe has not. This is a this is a very small fraction of the total time. So most of the time, nothing's happening. Is That's the implication of it. So the answer is, um, if uh, it's a very short amount of time, which also may allow that you can, you don't know the time particularly between flows and uh, uh, or these, uh, not the flows, the assumption is there's very little time with most flows. And then you have these, uh, these eruptive, these eruptive events, there's a discontinuity there, and you don't know a priori how much time is represented there. So it's a long winded way of saying we don't know, uh, you know, uh, it's very short sampling, as opposed to what we expect in sediment, this has a more or less a con continuity of a process that there's uh, the the cyclostratigraphy is very powerful in that sense because to conform to that sort of says that the sedimentation and therefore presumably a lot of the recording is going on at some stately level. So 
In the case of the heart basin, it's a meter per thousand years. That's the estimated sedimentation rate. You know, just to put in perspective, one meter is a thousand years, and we you can sample it as to whatever degree you wish. And so that at that level, you should be able to capture uh, short intervals. And I think that's the reason we captured E23R. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If I can have a question. <laughs> yes, sure. There are some of you over there. Has anybody, has uh, anybody, I go back to this. Has anybody uh, gone back to the uh, St. Audrey's Bay to confirm, verify, or modify the polarity structure right around the, right around the, um, Triassic, Jurassic, and Triassic interval. Are these all three of these real? None of them? Because to my not, I, I don't know of anyone who's gone back and redid it. Who's seeing in that group had done everything down to that? That's that section I showed uh, from their paper way back here. So the stuff works. And this, <clears throat> this is about. Yeah. Yeah, see here, here they, hey, Vout. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the great, that's why I was hoping you'd be there because <laughs> yeah. you, you guys did it right down to the uh, uh, the sampling, which uh, sort of said, would say that you don't have much uh, possibility of having any reversed intervals there until you get to the one up a million and a half years. But what about down? Yeah, we, we sampled also downwards. We found the, the, the signal very, very complex. And they decided not to uh, make any verdict on that, which basically means also that, that we didn't confirm uh, the previous uh, small reversals. But it's not an easy signal there; it's not straightforward. So a detailed resampling should be uh, yeah, logical. I know we discussed it a couple of years ago, maybe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's uh, it's important to do uh, to, to to confirm this this data. Because I'm not sure if there's any other places uh, that where the polarity stratigraphy has been done in uh, sufficient detail to say much about this. It's based on, like, it's much of the correlations are based on. Uh, now we sampled a lot of sections with Martijn in Austria and uh, in the Tetis region, but the signal was all always remagnetized there, so. Yeah, to his frustration, uh, I think 90% uh, of uh, the sections uh, gave remagnetized signals in the Triassic Jurassic boundary interval. Yeah, that's disappointing. See, one of the problems is uh, I see, uh, it, many of us may see is that uh, didn't, is that at the where the uh, the uh, what attracts what's a, what tr what's attractive about the Saint Audrey's Bay is that is that massive carbon isotope shift, you know, five per mil. It's and it's uh, uh, you know it's identified. You can see if, if the diagrams are still up, uh, and that but that occurs in a, and so that's often used for attempting correlation on a on a on a broad regional or global scale. But in this section, it's uh, like in Mark's uh, diagram clearly shows it comes at a uh, disconformity in this section. And I've seen that, I had a chance to look at it. And these are the most beautiful desiccation cracks I've ever seen. They really, you know, the, so so the section was, uh, had, it had to, the sea level, had to come up above sea level to get those desiccation cracks truncated and then went back down onto the waves. And before that even, I don't, well, actually, I don't know, I think it's before that there's seismites in there, which complicate things. They're sort of sh shaken up, you know, beautiful, uh, soft sediment deformation. So what the what the uh, carbon isotope curve means in that cross that section is not that clear in terms of its more global uh, possible implication. It's uh, maybe a very localized uh, feature that accounts for the uh, uh, the mud cracking or the desiccation cracks and the seismites. Yeah, it's a complicated interval there, but maybe Mark has more information. Yes, uh, Mark uh, has uh, written to me. He has no mic, so I, I'll read his uh, comment. 
um, maybe butchering the pronunciation of the, uh, the places, but uh, bear with me. Um, so he says, we have also sampled some other sections in Lavernock Point and State's core, which seem to show a similar polarity structure, or at least the reverse at the base of, of the Cotham MBR and uh, reverse in the Westbury. I can. Ah. Yeah. yeah, the Cotham is uh, an E23R. E e that that may, would make sense, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's that it's that reversed interval at the base of the little stock would uh, I would place I would put a I would bet a nickel on it. That's the that's a good candidate for E twenty three R, but it may not even be the best developed in terms of the magnetic record. But that's the one at least by by some prejudices which seem to conform to E twenty three R, which I think is a real feature in the in the geomagnetic record. I agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, okay. Uh, so Mark uh, is saying, maybe Mark, you can write in the chat to everyone. I will, I, will, uh, I will read it for you. So it says, question, may be the ETE is not so brief and rather broader than you see in the new work. For sure, the CEE uh, e at St. Saint Edris must be more than a few kilo, kilo years in width. So the extinction event may be a stand into the first basalts. Yeah, if, if I if I interpret that correctly, and I think this is uh, no, I think what more uh, I think this is reflected in this uh in this diagram that uh in the Dunin paper and in others. And so if uh uh E23R in the on the continental side is given the duration that looks, I think it's in several of us spent by 25,000 years. So that's a number, that's like a precession cycle. So that, and part of it, it depends on how you define the polarity interval. You know, it takes some time to go into a polarity thing, some come out and exactly how you define it, and then the recording process. So there's a there's some this uh this there's uncertainty here if you make it long like this well not dramatically long but you know in that twenty five thousand year and i think this is the i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong val but i think this is the way you folks have been correlating e23r in some cases like with the uh saint audrey's records so those two Reverse polarity uh, shown just below the, at the at the base of the little stock in the upper part of the Westbury. I think in some of the diagrams, I think it's implied here may correlate. So I think this speaks to like what I think Mark was just I think uh, uh, relay to Anita that that this it may be longer than what we have in the in the continental record, and then it allows a certain other range of correlations. I guess we would argue is that uh, I, I am arguing is that the that the polarity the, uh, the polarity record is reasonably you know it, uh, it's there's re definitely reversed in there yes going in and out there's some um, room to where you how you set the boundary but the but the cycle stratigraphy is is uh, is is reasonably clear and now there's XRF data that's going to be coming out and I think that'll be delineated even a little bit better and maybe it's maybe i'm wrong you know maybe it's longer but that's i think that's that's there's information that's being developed that should be able to delineate you know or just to put a, a better estimate on what the duration is but if it stays short as it's uh, right now it's surprisingly sure the way we favor it ten thousand years that's about as short as any interval that we know of like the Cobb mountain or something like that right so it would be a little surprising that we captured something that short back in this, you know, hazy part of the past. So um, anyway, that's it's, it remains to be resolved. I would go on, and this is what Marx is. I think the sedimentation rate, though, in the in the Saint Audrey's base section is not that fast to make that forty five thousand years, or uh, it could, but not. Uh, 
things happen, right? You know, in local scale, but uh, it's it doesn't conform that well. So it's a bit of a, 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 a still a bit of an uncertainty how how those correlate, and if those have not been replicated well, then you know that that puts another kind of a uh, factor into how we relate the marine to marine and non-marine, which I think is an important part. It's a very good point. Um, sorry for my pronunciation. In... <laughs> no, no, I got. You're right. Um, I don't know if there is any other question. If I can just leave, I know I'm over my time, but you know the the interesting, the really interesting thing. One of the interesting things is in the continental and the marine is that if if the uh, if the uh, the event is at the initial isotopic shift where there's also the pollen and dinoflagellate events. Well, those that don't coincide with the condodont extinctions. So there's, and so that's like the, that's like the big, one of the big players in the extinction event in the marine realm. So the two don't coincide, right? You know, just what we know right here. So trying to resolve this is in trying to come up with uh, causative agents they may not, both of them may, uh, may have been responding very differently to whatever it was or had very different agents. So that's uh, that's a reason to try to get this correlation kind of sorted out independent of the biota. You can't use the biota because obviously you're sort of in a circular loop or they don't coexist in these different uh, environments, whereas magnetics we hope does, you know. Looks like work to be done. Is there any other question? Not, not a question, just a comment. Dennis, uh, it's Mike here. I wanted to thank you for summarizing decades of work by tens if not hundreds of people on multiple continents and it's been a long time since I, I worked on this problem as you well know but I found it delightful to uh, to see this compendium of of information it was a really good presentation and thank you very much for re-educating me thank you thank you we can all agree with Mike's comment <laughs> thank you very much well, I guess uh, we can wrap up here. Uh, many, many thanks, uh, Dennis, for for your uh, talk. Uh, it was really, really uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you for the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. And thanks all for coming. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you again all for attending. Bye.